Good morning and welcome to the CAVE webinar for Wednesday the 2nd of September. Today we are looking at an introduction to ground gas and construction procedure with Paul Colbeck. As you'll know by now, my name is Jordan and I'm the Regional Services Administrator here at CAVE and I will be your moderator for today's session. Hopefully you know that we like to make these interactive, so please do send through any questions. Um, you can do this by emailing us or using the questions panel that will appear on your screen, or you can tweet us using hashtag KCPD. So this morning's presenter for you guys is Paul Colbeck. Paul has been in construction for over 30 years and has a Bachelor of Honours in Construction Management. Paul is the Director of GeoShield, GeoChild are a verification company which has been verifying gas remediation systems for six years. Paul is an assessor for NVQ2 gas installers and the NVQ4 in verification of ground gas protection systems. Paul assisted on creating the NVQ4 through to its launch. In 2018, Paul was a founder member in creating the British Verification Council, which Paul currently is chairman. He is also has his CSSW qualification, which is especially relevant in today's verification strategy. Paul's combination of experience in construction and ground cash strategy has allowed him to create quality assurance programs in Europe, Middle East and Asia. If you give me a couple of seconds, I'm just going to hand over to Paul now and he can take you through the session with you. Okay, Paul, we're all ready. Your screen is there if you want to start. Okay. Hello, everybody, and thanks, uh, thanks, Jordan. Um, it's always a little bit strange doing these uh, presentations via, um, uh, via these webinars because uh, you never know what the crowd's actually, you know, actually doing really. Um, <clears throat> you know, whether they're falling asleep or or, or whatever. So the feedback's uh, sometimes a little bit odd. Um, so. I've been in construction for well, since I was, you, you know, in the old days when you could you could go onto site when you're eight years old in a pair of flip flops and shorts, and you know that's that was great. And now you know it's uh, I've gone the full evolution really from then to project managing and then eventually coming to ground gas purely by accident. Um, so what I'm going to do today is just give you a a brief overview of everything from start start of the process right the way through to fundamentally the end and the certification when a project is completed so uh let's hopefully this will work um yeah so as i said an introduction into ground gas and the ground gas verification i'm primarily going to be bringing this all around to ground gas verification because that's that's what i do but what i feel is with ground gas <clears throat> is it's different to waterproofing there is a resultant harm to the 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 um uh, the inhabitants because of because of the nature of ground gas it will harm you so what i'm going to start with here the types and sources of ground gas just going to do a quick overview of that and then the process uh starting with stage one which is the site investigation uh then going into stage two which is ground gas design uh, stage three, which is the installation, and stage four, verification. I'm briefly going to cover the British Verification Council because I do think it's relevant um, for yourselves to understand where you can go to uh, for any questions in relation to ground gas. Then it's a it's a pretty hot topic at the moment. I think all all over Europe is radon. Um, I did a presentation in Switzerland, and the different viewpoints of different countries. Uh, is 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 <laughs> is amazing. Uh, I mean, we think we cover it 
probably think we cover it very well. We don't at all. Um, com countries like Poland, Germany have got a far better hold on radon than we have. Uh, and then I'm just going to give a little a little summary. So types sources of ground gas. Um, what we've got here is gases and vapors can be found in the ground and can be associated, associated with a number of sources. Methane and carbon dioxide can be natural occurring or they can be results of man-made activities such as landfills or coal mines and stuff like that. And then we have radon, which is a naturally occurring radioactive gas, which comes from the breakdown of rocks. And I've got no idea how it comes about. But one particular figure, which is of interest, really there, is the blue one. Now, there are 20, roughly 20,000 historic landfill sites across the UK. But then if you add all the coal mines that have been filled or purposely been filled, you know, you're talking that the UK is a pretty, <laughs> it's pretty got a lot of contamination in there. So, so yeah, and then you add the radar maps on there as well. You know, there's, um, it's, uh, it's a pretty rough old spot we live in, really. Um, so, types of ground gas, we've got radon, which is radioactive, methane, which is explosive, carbon dioxide, which is an asphyxiant, and volatile organic compounds, which is, <clears throat> A carcinogenic and has got a well fundamentally a load and load of nasty stuff that's involved those involved in there from benzene to a load of ozines and stuff like that. <clears throat> so why protect against ground gas? Here we've got the Abistead disaster, <clears throat> which is I think 1984, uh, and this really started the awareness. Um, this this particular example um had added uh, sensitivity because it was really to this particular area being flooded over the winter and they took the local village to this place to to show them what precautions are, were going to be put in place uh, i think somebody went off for a crafty cigarette and methane exploded and it resulted in a lot of deaths so that was one from 1984 in relation to directly in relation to methane. Then we have carbon dioxide, and this is a much re more recent one. This was in Gorbridge in the borders. Now, 64 houses, um, there is a lot of rulings going on here. Who was at fault? It was a contractor. Uh, it was the site investigation report, didn't identify a local tip in the area, etc., etc. But the result was that carbon dioxide was building up in underneath the houses and it was causing people to feel a bit sick very drowsy uh, etc so as you can see they started demolishing these um there is excuse me a certain viewpoint in the in the gas world that well should we really be demolishing you know that should be the last resort uh should we retrospectively put a membrane in there but for the homeowner, you've got to look at the stigma that's associated with this particular site. And there is, uh, you know, you've got to try selling your house after this and people are going to not want to buy a house that's associated with this particular project, which is very, very uh, famous in the UK. And it's very, very recent as well. I mean, it's still ongoing. Uh, there are still houses that are stood up um, awaiting the outcome of um, various court cases. Uh, then we've got volatile organic compounds. Here we've got a, um, a particular, it was a factory uh, where they built bricks, or where they made bricks, sorry, not built them. Um, and then you can see the results of these uh, volatile organic compounds. They're very, very nasty. And primarily you come across them on when they're renovating petrol stations, um, uh, that type of thing. Uh, you've got to take real precaution with these. Um, it does make a real difference when you are, they've identified this in the in Syria 735 and BS8485 that a specialist installer and specialist membranes are required for vol volatile organic compounds because they do damage the membrane quite considerably. You can't use tapes 
tapes are eaten by the volatile organic compounds. So all the products have to be welded. So volatile organic compounds are uh, quite serious to be dealt with. Um, in most cases, they do remove them from site, but you will still have <clears throat> you will still have certain residues, uh, and you will get um, uh, you will get vapors coming up, which can leach leach into the uh, leach into the building. So um, they're they're a particularly awful one. A radon. I'm going to cover this in more depth a little bit later on, but you can see from the two maps the extent of radon in the UK. Uh, primarily Devon, Cornwall, Wales. <clears throat> uh, then we've got uh, looks like uh, Northumberland going up there. I know Aberdeen up there is particularly particularly bad. Um, you can get these sources of maps from Public Health England or <clears throat> BR211. One thing to be aware of though is <clears throat> the white areas show there's little chance of radon. Uh, not to one percent however that's you've got to be a little bit careful with this because sometimes the white areas are actually a lack of testing that's being done there so it's um it's you've got to take these radar maps as a guide more than anything um and as public health england does recommend any new build it recommends that you do a pretty cheap radon test afterwards to prove that there is no radon uh, in your uh, in your uh, new dwelling, which is both for housing and for the workplace, you have a duty of care to the workplace uh, that you work in. Um, so, so that's something to be aware of. But I'll cover radon a little bit more um, in depth later. The process, <clears throat> the process and guidance. This is this is a bit really. I get involved with as a verifier. So stage one is the site investigation. The local authority planning conditions will all ask for a site investigation. Um, and they will put planning restrictions on that. They have a they have a, a plan which they have to follow uh, that's issued from local government. Uh, it's part 2A or something like that. And then which instructs them they've got to have a site investigation if you're wanted to build some houses on there so they can fundamentally assess uh, or put planning conditions in place that's based on that site investigation. So to do a site investigation there's there are three phases but I'm only going to cover the two really here. We've got phase one which is called a desktop which is where we look at the maps, we do a walkover, um, we look at all evidence that's available to us without fundamentally digging a big hole in the site. Um, a lot of evidence can be found this way. Um, past uses, uh, you know, was there a factory there? Wasn't there? Is, has it been a farm all its all its uh, all its life? Uh, that type of thing. So a desktop phase one study can be uh, often enough to say a one house dwelling. Um, the planning conditions will accept a phase, just a phase one, which is obviously a lot cheaper. Then we come to phase two, which is an intrusive test. Now this involves putting boreholes in the ground and monitoring over three months and taking six readings. Uh, and that will tell us what the CS value is. Now the CS value is the gas, caster, gas characteristic value uh, for that particular site, um, and which means the intensity of contamination. It was also tell us the type of gas that's involved, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, VOCs. So that tells us everything about that particular site. That CS value fundamentally allows us to start the design process going on from there. Um, there are uh, developments being made in this intrusive test that say you've got a very contaminated site you can now use monitors that take readings continuously which obviously will give you a more accurate reading and it's quite important on highly contaminated sites uh, because when the reason you take the six readings over three months is the barometric pressure 
that has a fundamental effect on ground gas in the ground. Um, so if you have continuous monitoring, that is a much more accurate um, process and will then give you, um, uh, let's say it could be, if you were doing it with the, um, the uh, three month test with six readings, it could be a CS5. Whereas if you do a continuous monitoring process, it actually could downgrade it down to CS3 and give it a fundamentally accurate reading. So stage two, ground gas design. This is all based around BS8485 2015 and it's just been updated in 2019. Now, out of a lot of BS documents, I think this is a good one. Most British standards can, uh, you know, are pretty grim. You know, if you can't sleep, then you read a British standard document. Um, but this is actually quite okay, structured, structured really well, in my opinion. Um, so I'm just going to go through a little little example here oh after this sorry so the design principles are we've got various tables in there um, we've got the membrane which forms a protection we've got venting which forms another protection through pressure relief passive venting or active venting and then we have the actual structure so we've got these three methods of protecting the building now under bs8485 you have to have a minimum of two protection methods so there's your start point. So then all this is in BS8485. So this particular worked example, I'm going to use a residential house, block and beam construction or segmental block, a CS2 gas, gas, gas characteristic, um, which is carbon dioxide. So, so the process is we've got um, on table two, we've identified it's CS2. The carbon dioxide is greater than 5%, so that's the hazard potential. Uh, you've got that information from your site investigation report. That's done by a specialist. Then we go to table three. We identify the type of building. In this work case, it's a type A, private ownership, residential, i.e. a house. Then we go to table four. Uh, sorry about this. So we put the table four, which is CS2, and Table three, type A, which then tells us we require three and a half points to, uh, uh, to achieve this criteria using the three methods of protection. So then we drop down to the first green box and we've got table five, which is the structural barrier. So it's a block and beam, segmental construction. You don't get any points because you have all these gaps in that, in that structure which will allow gas through if it's left on its own. So that's no points. Table six is ventilation. Now we have good performance passive because of the construction of beam and block. It, it, it doesn't have a very high performance because of its structure, but underneath it is always well vented. You have telescopic air bricks, so it's got good performance when it comes to ventilation. So one and a half points. Then we come to table seven which is the uh, uh, which is the membrane now the membrane gives you two points now there are certain criteria in that table seven in that it has to be verified in accordance with series 735 the permeability rating has to be less than 40 milliliters per second the thickness has to be a minimum thickness if it conforms to all of that you will get two points so that then one and a half plus two gives you three and a half points that matches the requirements on the blue boxes so we've met the design it's a very very simplistic um, uh, way to design now this is only guidance this is only an indication you know the, the fundamentals the the actual design has to be done by a specialist um, you know where the membrane goes venting calculations etc etc but this is a good guide to say what what is required um sorry i'm just there we go so then we come on to the next phase stage three which is installation installation um this is the whole reason in 2015 that syria 735 and i've got a job because installation of gas membrane varied so much there was no control 
and yeah, hence I've got a job, hence I'm presenting to you today. This particular photograph, um, I can sort of look at this straight away and say this was done by a specialist. Uh, all of the detailing around the pipe penetrations, internal, external corners are identical. Um, it looks, it looks good. Um, if it looks right, it often is right, and that is right. That's a good application. Good, uh, good application. Here we've got a slightly different one. Um, here we've got uh, this is um, a more robust product. This is actually actually is a waterproof barrier as well. This is where. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. This is where it is <clears throat> you're crossing over into two British standards at the moment, and this is causing a little bit of an issue um, where you've got BSA 102 for waterproofing and then BSA 485. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we've got two different uh, two different criteria, and they're asking almost two different things. And uh, are they both wanting two different things? And I know BSA 102 has been updated shortly, and I think they're going to introduce certain uh, certain gases or account for gas in, in that particular um, document a little bit more. The problem is fundamentally is in BSA 102, it says you've got to expect for leaks. Now, you can't really expect that in ground gas because if you've got leaks, then you're going to get a potential route for gas. So it's it's something which has been uh, which has been um, which has been looked into. This particular product is a visqueen product called GeoSeal. Uh, so what it is, it is a waterproof barrier, and it has a you can't see it from here, but it has a texture. So when they pour the concrete, the concrete goes into the texture and is adhered to the concrete. So it is a gas membrane and a waterproofing membrane as well. It's a dual purpose machine, uh, dual, dual purpose um, product. Here is a typical um, uh, internal corner and external corner and pipe penetration done very, very well. This has been done by a specialist or a trained ground worker, uh, but that's a specialist. You can see how the how they built it so when it's finished it's parallel to the um, parallel to the cavities um you you look at that and you think yeah that's that's good you wouldn't really look at you wouldn't really go in there with your pick and probe your airline saying to 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 take that any that's that's good installation uh, this is where we get follow on trades coming in um they've applied a membrane potentially very well, it's been verified, and then the steel fixers has come on, and yeah, they've had some fun. With this one, they have got a protective fleece on, so, you know, there is some protection there. Um, they've used the right reinforcement bars, uh, the Mars, concrete Mars bars, so it is pretty good. But with this particular type of, um, um, reinforcement, you know, you, there's a lot of people walking over the membrane. So you have to allow for that when you're very fine, especially that if there is no protection board, then do you have to come back in and then recheck the work after the steel fixes have, have been? It's, um, it's, it's, it's a pretty uh, uh, contentious part of verification uh, because the contractor, obviously, he's got a very tight program He's seen that the gas membrane's gone in well, and then all he's bothered about is the steel going down and the concrete being poured. Uh, and the steel fixer isn't bothered, bothered about that piece of plastic that's being beautifully installed. It is, it's not his, uh, it's, it's just not bothered. Uh, here we see a sump. Um, this is for a retrospective project um, for actually radon. Uh, what you're seeing here is, is it allows these a low point. So the gas will go into there and it is actually actually actively sucked out uh, by a fan which then terminates above the eaves. You have here uh, on the, the left and the right, that's called a ge composite geotextile, which again takes the gas, the gas goes up into there and will direct it to the sump boxes. And then the membrane will sit on top of that geocomposite. Uh, that's fairly complex. Complex design was that one. That was a retrospective project. Um, 
here we have um, on this uh, vertical wall, uh, this is a retaining wall, there was um, a gas resistant self adhesive placed on the wall, then a protection. And because the, the gas required it, the ground gas or the CS value required it, it required venting as well. So these are the vents that uh, are required um, to vent the building inside. Quite a complex design, this one. This was a CS3 uh, in London, a CS3 basement in London. That's this one. Uh, you can see what a, a good specialist applicator can do uh, with, um, with, the, the, with gas resistant self adhesive. The white product is a foil backed bitumen tape. And what you can do with this is you can form it into quite intricate shapes by heating the bitumen and activating the bitumen, and it will stick in all kinds of profiles. So it's just like wrapping a wrapping a Christmas present, and if an installer knows what they're doing, there isn't many details that they can't do. Steel stanchions, you know, they can they can go around all the webs uh, of of that quite easily in in a matter of probably about four minutes. Uh, they're very very quick. Again, very good application of a CS2 membrane. Um, yeah, there's not a lot to say with this. You're covering all the cavities, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think with this one, you would never do it, but as a good test, you could probably fill all this full of water and it would hold water. Uh, that's what you want, because if you can hold water, guess what, get in. Um, <clears throat> here you can see the, the composite geocomposite, which I talked about. This is a 25 mil vent mat. Um, you can put this over the whole, ex uh, whole footprint of the building should you wish it, uh, or you can do it in strips. If you put it in strips, that's normally known as pressure relief. Um, you only get half a point for pressure relief, whereas if it was over the whole footprint and the calculations were done correctly, then you would probably get one and a half points. But pressure relief, you only get half and you would just put it in strips. What it's doing is allowing the gas to come up, it will hit these strips and release the pressure underneath the, uh, underneath the membrane. So uh, it's, it's a it's good design principle. Uh, BS 8485 states that if possible, all designs should have pressure relief. So um, it's something to complete in design. And my particular section, uh, or my speciality, if you like, uh, which is verification, <clears throat> all based on Syria 735. Uh, this gives you guidance. Uh, on the uh, on the verification of protection system for buildings against hazardous ground gases. Um, like I said earlier, protection against ground gases is not waterproofing. Waterproofing, you only get your feet wet, uh, and often as not, you can repair that. You can do resin injection, um, etc. Uh, you can do renders, etc. You can repair if water's coming into your basement or your structure. When you've got gas coming in or you haven't had it verified or you've not put a membrane in at all, the retrospective is very, very hard. So it's something to bear in, something to bear in mind. I would say 30% of our business is fundamentally people who have not put a membrane in, not had it validated, and therefore the incorrect documentation has not been issued to the local authority uh or they've just not done the correct design uh, i.e not taking the membrane across the cavity they say well does it matter well yes it does because that's a key route for gas right up your cavity and into your building um so you know gas is not waterproofing um, so consequences well fundamental consequences is you don't die from waterproofing but there's consequences as you've seen from those examples uh, Gobridge, uh, Abbeystead, <clears throat> and there are quite a few others. Um, it, uh, it could potentially result in um, harm to um, harm to health. So why do we verify human error? <clears throat> um, photograph on your left, the one with the green membrane, that was done by a specialist. They did it in uh, pretty poor conditions, and they didn't activate the um, 
uh, the, the bitumen. So the bitumen started all to peel off because it hasn't, wasn't warm enough. And also the, uh, where the laps are, it was damp and the tapes didn't stick or the wells, on this particular case, the wells hadn't, uh, hadn't, uh, hadn't welded the two seams together. Uh, they'd had some wind and it had blown up all, all, the, um, all, the, uh, all the seams apart. Um, on the right there, that is a membrane that's folded, typically radon. And um, uh, yeah, well, you've got gas, potentially got a route through to that. Um, people say to me, well, when you pour concrete on that, it'll compress it. But when you're pouring the concrete with the joint, then concrete will go into that, um, will open that lap up. So, yeah. Uh, what we have here is typically for when we're verifying um, substrate not prepared correctly. You will see from, you will see if you had an example in front of you, typically CS2 membranes in accordance with table seven, which this one is. Um, this is a visqueen membrane. They're all the same due to Capital Valley, um, Proctors, all of them are fundamentally the same. They're all about 370 grams. Um, they're all the same thickness and they are not robust at all. Um, I don't know if you can see from the photograph, but where you stand on it and there is a pe pebble underneath, you will puncture a hole in it. They are not robust membranes at all. So if you have any bits of um, brick or mortar droppings underneath, there is a potential that you will damage that membrane. You can also see um, just on the left, you will see this is typically how when an installer will arrive, that they put a membrane underneath that internal blockwork wall and it's being covered in mortar droppings. All those mortar droppings have to be cleaned off or the tape won't stick. Uh, so you imagine that's a lot of work. Uh, often it's not what they'll do, they'll put the shovel down the face of the brick and scrape it out. So they've just put a great big hole where the, um, where the membrane is coming underneath the wall. Uh, typically in housing as well, excuse me, the pipes always like to be as tight up in the corners as you can possibly get them. So how do you detail around those? Very hard. Um, so this is all about talking to the pre-verificate, talking to the site manager, etc., at the earliest stage possible in a pre-verification plan, but I'll go into that a bit later. Um, this is typically what's happened here is a pipe penetration. The bitumen, which I talked about, has not been activated properly, it's not hot enough, and it's just fallen off the, um, the, the, um, uh, the collar of the pipe. Um, you can get preformed top hats, which are very, very good, but pound to anything, when you turn up onto a building site, what they've done is they always like to put the collars at the level that you're applying the membrane. And if you try and put a top hat over a collar, it doesn't work. So again, it's something to be, something to be aware of. Uh, detailing, um, bricklayers don't like gas membranes. Um, their typical thing is, well, our job's more important. We want to put 4 million blocks down in a day. And your membrane's in our way. So we're just going to destroy all the membranes. We're going to cut it off because it doesn't lie flat, quite as flat as we want it to do in the joints. And yeah, so you're, you're all already in a, you're already in a battle. Um, what you often get as well is there's one way to build is you put a gas resistant DPC around the perimeter. They build a house, then you will come and a uh, specialist installer will come and do the infill. Now, as you can see, again, you've got latents all over that gas resistant DPC. The brick layer is install the, the uh, gas resistant DPC and he doesn't know how to do reveals. He doesn't have to do internal corners uh, where a roll finishes. He hasn't taped and it is a real problem. On construction sites um, at the present time. Um, reinforcement, um, especially the weak stuff, you know, you stand on it and the long ends, some are pointed up, some are pointed down, and they just go straight through the membrane. Um, and typically what happens as well is you get 
you know, the bright lad with the still saw and he's going down and he's firing his way down there, cutting all the me- cutting all the ends off and thinking he's doing a good job and he's actually burning holes in all the membrane as he goes down. Um, so, uh, so yeah, there's uh, a lot to be aware of. Follow on trades. Um, this particular photograph shows um, laser screeds, um, which uh, are a nightmare. Uh, gas protection or gas proofing, gas membranes verification is is not really well suited for laser screeding. Um, you have 10 wagons all stacked up waiting to get flood their concrete. They're not bothered about driving over the membrane. They're not bothered about the the steel. Uh, the guy who's pushing the, uh, the the spout walks over the steel. Those ends of the steel go into the membrane. Uh, the wagon can't be bothered to go over the protection that you put down. Laser screed doesn't like sand underneath because it alters the levels. So you've got stones underneath the membrane. It's tough. It has to be correctly managed does uh, laser screening. It can be done, but the control has to be done by either the verification officer uh, in conjunction with the site management team, not the other way around where the screeders are in control. If the screeders are in control, it doesn't work. It will, uh, it will compromise the, uh, uh, the installation. This is a typical example my guys come across for verification. They've verified the gas membrane, which has gone in very well. And then the next time they will ask to become, they'll ask to be uh, invited back. Um, they've got <clears throat> all this to look at. And uh, so, how do you verify the membrane that has has it been damaged since they've installed the steel? If it has been damaged, how do you put it right? Um, that's um, that's the nature of ground gas at the moment. Um, BS8485 does, for, does push for protection, um, but protection costs money. Um, an architect or an engineer may decide, right, okay, we're going to put protection in. Then a QS gets his hands on it or an estimator and think, right, well, what can I say, do to save money? Right, I'm going to take out this protection board. Um, and that is often the case. Um, what they don't realize is that it costs to have this, we come now and verify this, at every stage, so it's probably going to cost more in verification uh, than it would do in just case of putting a protection board down. Um, so, yeah. So this was the key, the fantastic um, statement or the paragraph that came out, um, which gave me a job. Um, I'd love to say it's making me millions, but uh, it's giving me a hell of a lot of stress. So. The difference between the, I think it's the 2007 version and the 2015 version was verified in accordance with Syria 735. Um, that fundamentally made it so all installation <clears throat> of ground gas, uh, ground gas membranes, ground gas systems is verified in accordance with Syria 735. Syria 735 is a good document. It shows all the testing procedures. Uh, it does need, in my opinion, need updating a little bit. That was 2014 was Syria 735, 2015. So you could say immediately it's out of date, but the progress now, we're in 2020. You know, things have fundamentally changed quite a lot since uh, 2014 in relation to ground gas um, and people's awareness. Um, the one key thing in there, it states that it has to be independent. It cannot be. Um, it cannot be an installer. It cannot be the manufacturer. Uh, and it, excuse me. And it has to be somebody who understands ground gas installation. Um, in my opinion, there should be other provisos in there as well. Uh, you should have PI, uh, etc., um, specific to ground gas inspe- in, inspection, um, and but this is where Syria 735 does require does require a little bit of updating because things have changed quite quite dramatically. When you verify, this is what I talked hinted out a little bit earlier. 
Series 735, Series 735 recommend that every project has a pre-verification plan. Large projects, we will have a pre-verification meeting. So we can identify the investigation report, site investigation report, check that, check it against the engineer's detail, check the engineer's details against the ground gas design. The ground gas material specification, is it a VLC barrier, CS2 membrane, and the project specification. So really what we're doing as a verification company is validating everything so it conforms with all guidance. From then, we will do a verification risk assessment. So is it a specialist installer, ground worker? We will then decide what testing we're gonna do, the number of visits, uh, check the CS classification, and then a method statement of how we're going to do it uh, going forward. We will then have a pre-site meeting with all the relevant parties who's required there. If it's a big one, it may be, it may be the engineers, it may be the um, site project manager, site manager, the installers, the steel fixers, the concrete um, um, applicators. So, you know, all they are there and they are then aware of what would happen if they put a load of holes in it with the application of the steel. We would say, right, you pull that, we're not going to sign that particular area off and potentially your building will not be able to be, will not fulfill its planning conditions. As soon as you say things like that, they take a different attitude. But they have to be aware at the earliest possible stay, so stage. So a pre-verification plan is crucial. All projects, in my opinion, whether whether it's one house or whether it's a block of flats of 200, should all have a pre-verification plan. Um, that's the difference between a good verifier and a bad, ver bad verifier, in my opinion. So you've formed your pre-verification plan, you have done a pre-verification meeting, everybody knows where they stand, so you're good to go. A verification report should follow the pre-verification plan. If the installer comes and then decides, I'm not gonna use Visqueen, I'm gonna use Juta, that is a design change. That has to be identified, that has to then go through the process. You wouldn't believe how many times that happens. Um, it is, uh, it, it's mind numbing. They don't realize, right, okay, well, all the drawings have got to be redrawn. redrawn. Uh, so, you know, so a recognized strategy following the pre-verification plan. A structured photographic survey, uh, a recognized and report defects, record the testing results and sign it off. What happens then is all those are put in the report. You have maybe five reports, which covers the, not necessarily the whole of the site, dependent on the risk. We may only do 50% of the site. All depends on the method statement and the risk we've done. In Scotland, slightly different. They more air towards 100%. Down in here in England, there are set tables in Series 735 which show you the percentage if you are using a specialist or a ground worker or the type of construction. Typical test, this frustrates me a little bit. Uh, in Series 735, it's, it's like stepping back in time to the prehistoric time because with the tests that we actually do. Uh, we do a pick and probe, which is walking down like a crab and actually putting a screwdriver or brad hole into the lap to check it's, it's, it's either been welded or the tapes there and is suitable. We do an air lance, which fires compressed air, 50 PSI, 50 millimeters away from the lap. That's supposed to show the integrity in of the, the weld or again the tape. Uh, if it withstands that it shows it's um, it, it shows that it shows that it's robust enough. Um, well if you, if you ever get a chance to have a go, see what you think. Um, but if it isn't, or if there's a hole, or if the, the tape hasn't quite taken it, it will whistle. So, yeah, so that's that one. Then we have the Delectic with your spark test. You can see it's earthed. He goes over with his brush. If there's a hole in it, it will beep on his monitor. And you can set it to the thickness of the, the, uh, the material. It's very good for liquids, is this. Brilliant for liquids. Uh, the problem with dialectics on aluminium foil membranes is it doesn't always work on certain ones because of their construction. 
some have a very thin top layer and it already acts so it's something to be aware of but an experienced verifier with a dielectric test I would know that anyway um, then we have inert gas testing um, this can be done uh, like the guy on the uh, left this can be done retrospectively to check whether a membrane's installed correctly so what it'll do is close up all the air vents and pump in the inert gas we'll go around with a very sensitive meter inside check all the door reveals under the sinks etc etc and you can see the integrity of the, the installation we can do it for a new build where we will just uh, like in this particular example there we'll put the pump in there we'll put the gas in blow it up and then go around with the monitor again if it is if it is where well, you haven't built it and you haven't got the blocks around you can actually lay chains going right the way around create segments and blow it up so it is possible uh, as well it's not often used now, we're doing one in scotland where they've actually insisted on it but it's quite rare there is a smoke test in series 735 which in my opinion is a complete waste of time and i've never ever used it uh, and i don't know anybody who has um so the progression of verification in general verification is unpopular you imagine you get a one of my engineers he's 24 years old goes on there's a 80 year old installer my guy says well look that's not right and you know he's not happy how come you know more than me um so you know we're already uh, already not very popular it's like the old clack of works you know they were not very popular when in my day uh you know they used to come and think oh god almighty is coming um so it's a bit bit similar to us um and the biggest criticism is standardization verification you get some guy he'll come on he'll take a photo about six miles away and that's verification you'll get somebody come in and they will literally go over with it with a uh, i was going to say a microphone a magnifying glass and slow the process up and say now i've got to send my photographs back for approval before you can go ahead that's what installers don't like the need standardization so the progression over the of verification which i'm glad to say i've been involved in quite heavily we've got claire they've put an accreditation scheme together the pca like the cssw they're creating um membership for ground gas and a standard for ground gas the bvc which is all about training and uh, a recognized symbol in the industry and abbey which is the mvq4 for a qualification so you can get um the cloud which is the ground gas accreditation bvc is that robust membership and training pca audited membership and abbey which is the mvq4 training uh we've tried to it's a the problem in the ground gas industry is a lack of training that's available uh we run training for anybody in the industry if anybody from cave wanted if you were 12 people that wanted to know more about gas or know about installation we could arrange that day uh, we did a lot prior to covid where they would join us we we did like days where we would pick a 12 subjects and then you would be invited to look at let's say waterproofing situations you would look at radon and you would be invited to join us on those particular days claire have um done training day or they produced a training day regarding verification um which is which is very very informative it's it's a snapshot into the industry going into uh, a little bit into installation a little bit into using the air lancing etc it's a very very good course then the pca do a similar one and then syria provide uh cpds and information as well uh which a number of my colleagues at the bbc do um oh i'm stuck sorry there we go so i'm quickly going to talk about i'm going to flash through the bbc really the bbc was created by a number of companies because i felt that we were not represented correctly within the industry everybody liked to tell war stories about how bad verifiers were and i thought this was very very unfair so a few of us got together and decided to create the british verification council what we wanted to do was bring together these guys 
and if anybody was a member of the BBC, they would look at it and think, right, this is a standardized approach. So if you saw a verification company with the BBC logo on their website, you would then know that they follow a standardized approach. So it's giving confidence to installers as well. We use this also to train. Anybody can ring up the BBC and ask for training. And we also do training once a year at a big symposium. And thirdly, because we're a joint body, now we can start to influence um, uh, organizations and legislation. We've already been heavily involved in the new Syria document for retrospective installation. Uh, British standards is more difficult, uh, but at least we can we can put something in there when they come to industry uh, industry uh, advice industry approval. Uh, local authorities, I do a lot of presentations to Yalpag, NHBC, uh, and warranty. Well, hopefully they will start to understand uh, particular issues that's associated with uh, ground gas and ground gas standardisation and uh, verification. And then trade organisations. Well, like yourself here, you know, we do. I'm representing the BBC, um, so hopefully, hopefully this is of uh, use. Anyway, oh, oops, sorry. There we go. So membership, membership to the BBC can only be a verifier. But we looked at this, and this has to be. You can't just pay your money and then you remember. We have an interview, we have a uh, an examination, and we also have now with the clear accreditation scheme coming on you will also have to pass that as well so it's a very robust process to become a member of the british verification council uh, so we feel that's we feel that's the right way to go um sorry there we go so we have the symposium which i mentioned so anybody's invited to that we work with the uk radio association uh, Oh, we're wanting to so we'll do a joint symposium to go through a lot of ground gas subjects um manufacturers will present uh, etc uh, for that and uh, it's a good it's it's a good education set um things often about 12 presentations by people from all, all through our industry um the future for verification why verification needs the bvc etc etc well, this guy was jailed uh, for um, falsifying verification records. So it proves it is on the radar. So if you don't take this seriously, then you will. I think he was put away for six months or something like that. So <clears throat> you've got to do it right. Uh, you do have a duty of care. As I said, it's not waterproofing. What we don't want is this. What we do want is this so this is what we want that's what the bvc do so that's my bid on verification i'm now going to quickly talk about i'm very aware of time i'm going to talk about radon to me radon is a is a bit of a, a sore subject in in my book approximately 1100 deaths per year now that's from public health england that some say it's nearer 2,000 deaths per year. Now, over the last three years, I don't think there's been a death in relation to carbon dioxide, methane, or VOC. So, should we take this seriously? Okay. They've got it down here. We're second, third only to what? Road accidents and lung cancer from six. Um, so, right, okay, well, drink driving, we take that very seriously. Accidents at work, we spend a fortune on HSE. So what are we doing in relation to radon at the moment? Not a great deal. Are we burying our heads in the sand? Well, personally, yeah. I was watching television with my daughter and I was watching The Simpsons and it was unbelievable because the episode that I was watching had this particular one on the right. Where this hobo goes into the basement, and, Ray, and Bart actually asks him, "Do you know what radon is?" And I'm thinking, and he said, "No." Oh, good, you'd be all right then. I'm thinking, just goodness me, you know, this is even on the Simpsons that they've got they've identified the hazards associated with radon. 
and we're just ignoring it in this country and maybe you can even get a crusty the clown radon detector so you know it's uh it's it's good now this particular slide there was a, a lady in america who was adamant that she didn't have radon in her basement she said no there's nothing there absolutely nothing so these scientists set up this this radon uh, this radon cloud collector or whatever it was and they put this it was the biggest one they'd ever made and they put this in her basement and uh, and this is what she saw and these are all the radon particles that were in her basement and she was thinking right okay well i'd like some radon protection in my basement please but it's it's to me that is a fantastic you know when you can't see well you're trying to explain to someone well, oh you're going to get harm from radon well i can't see it so i'm not bothered about it but you put one of these chambers in your basement or you know in your living room and you'll be thinking yeah i do really want correct radon protection uh so uh current guidance um at the moment you do not have to have a radon barrier in verified or inspected okay so we've got bs8485 which is guidance it says in there it should be considered the same as carbon dioxide and methane so we have one bit that's saying it should be Syria 735 it says it's good practice for the testing and verification of radon the problem document is this br211 that guidance there should fundamentally state radon protection should be verified in accordance with Syria 735 if that did then radon barriers would be treated exactly the same as carbon dioxide and methane that's the problem at the moment which hopefully we're going to be dealing with also there is a misconception people think that um, new buildings are brilliant for radon protection and old buildings are rubbish the exact opposite because old buildings often have wood windows they are not airtight so the radon can come in and it can disperse through the windows uh, etc because it's drafty under doors the new buildings are often airtight tested most of them are now so the radon gets in it can't get out so you've got an issue so that you've got that misconception um we have radon design two methods um they've got br211 look at the radon maps tells you whether it's basic or full public health england look at the radon maps you can even put a postcode in there and you can get a report look at the maps and it will then tell you whether it's basic or full there is two types basic full difference basic is just a membrane full is a membrane and either venting or a sump okay so basic you can see that's basic you've got a membrane going across the whole of the, uh, the project i will say that that has been verified and been installed by a specialist typically radon membranes are a different color they're quite a bright color the reds purples yellows that type of thing um, currently the minimum specification is 1200 gauge virgin polymers that's the minimum now i think later on this year that is going to change and it's going to in increase to 0.4 micron so it's going to be much thicker and robust there's some photographs later on which will show you the problem full radon is membrane and a sump as the sump or ventilation if you have segmental blocks you've already got your ventilation there okay so the missing link the current attitude among house builders and warranty providers is that installation of radon systems should not be verified i'm not going to name the warranty provider but nhbc do not think radon is an issue and should be verified they think that the ventilation provided by block and beam provides the solution uh, i'll show you some photographs in a minute this is in complete contrast to carbon dioxide and methane radon gas remediation are stalled predominantly by house builders and their subcontractors 
who have no knowledge of the, of the ramifications of poor installation. And that is fact. This lack of knowledge extends down from management to the installer. The installer and the management think fundamentally this is a DPM. The DPM, you don't have to take, make the same attention to detail. You don't have to go over the cavities. You don't have to tape around pipes, etc., etc. And that is the problem. This particular project here, as we talk about the NHBC's uh, reliance on venting, commonly, how many people put deck in, put planters? Where's the, how does venting work now? It doesn't. And if the radon barrier is not installed correctly, you have fundamentally no protection against radon. I've got to hold my hand up. This is my house. So, so you know, I know, I know there's air bricks under there. Um, so that's it. And again, people plant trees and shrubs and thing around there. So, you know, it's, you cannot allow for future planning. That's, this is, this is in relation to the Taipei. This is why Taipei is at such a high risk because you get people going in there, they do extensions, they put conservatories up and they block all the air bricks up. Um, so that's, that's the issue. You get them changing the, um, the, uh, the levels so the air bricks are fundamentally not as effective and do not perform as well we talked about radon barriers now radon barriers typically are folded carbon dioxide and methane are all in a row radon membranes are folded okay so when you get a fold they have a memory and they will pop open as i said before well the weight of the concrete will push it down Yep, but if the concrete's flowing from bottom to top, then the concrete will flow straight into that tape joint because that tape is very, very weak. Membranes are 1200 gauge. 1200 gauge, I'm afraid you could walk across it in your boots and you'll put holes in it if there is any grit underneath it at all. They are not robust enough, and that is why the BBA is increasing the thickness of these membranes. Uh, I did this verification myself. This ground worker thought he'd done the best installation in the world. And when I pointed out to him, I says, well, tell me a route for gas. And he couldn't identify this was the route for gas. So, you know, that was me after asking him the question. So, yeah. Specialist installation. If you don't go down the line of specialist installation, training. You know, train these ground workers so they know what they're doing. Or they're aware of why they are doing it is the key thing. So, in summary, I think the future is bright for verification. Again, I'm sort of specifying verification because I'm a verifier. Two years ago, we had nothing. Now we have structured training. We have an MVQ4. We have an accreditation process, which is coming through through Clare, and our own association, the BBC. This should provide confidence to installers, building control, warranty providers, planners, and contractors. So this has been just a brief insight into ground gas remediation. There are elements in there which I could put in there and talk about for 40 minutes for various sectors. Um, so I, I, I apologize for skipping over various items, but I hope it has been of, uh, of use and I think I've bored you long enough and I'll <laughs> hand you back to Jordan really. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Okay, so uh, what we'll do, I will send over any questions anybody has um, to you outside of the session. Um, won't keep anyone any longer. Um, okay. If you have any questions, guys, please do send them through to me and I'll email them over to Paul and I'll send out all of the answers to everyone who has um, listened in today. Um, so we have our next webinar on the 23rd of September, which is on mental health awareness. So hopefully I'll see you guys online then. Um, so with that, obviously, if you have any feedback or comments, please do send them through as well. Um, but just a thank you to Paul for providing the session this morning. Um, and thank you to everyone who has listened in. Um, and hopefully I'll see you all online again soon. Thank you very much.